time has arrived. I'm ready. I'm going to get on the front row. I'm going to take my shoes off if I have to. I thought about bringing some sawdust in here and scattering it around on the floor and getting a couple real big poles and just sticking them up here, hanging a few light bulbs down in the place so Brother Shambach would feel at home. But, uh, you know, we built this church as a result of Brother Shambach's preaching. Brother Norval Hayes grabbed me and he said, you know your church, Norval Hayes says of this church, that it has the greatest Sunday morning worship services of any church in the country. And I didn't say that. That's what Norval Hayes said. And he does have a tendency to exaggerate. But nonetheless, that, that's what he says. And he said this church has camp meeting, three services a week, 52 weeks a year. And we really do. I don't say that facetiously. We really do. And when we got ready to build this building, he said, I, I, he said now, you know what you need. You need a building that Brother Shambach would feel comfortable in. And I said, well, do you know such a place? He said, he told me about a church in Baton Rouge that the inside of it makes him feel like he's in the tent. And he said it's the most conducive building he's ever been in for camp meeting kind of worship services where they're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ where people have room to dance and where people can get we didn't like balconies you know because you got to go outside to get back in and when sinners are ready to get to the altar the last thing you want to let them do is go out I like them where they just kind of get I thought about putting ejector seats back there just kind of catapult them this way I know we're making some of you nervous back there it's, it's all right the Holy Ghost does have an ejection button. He'll eject you right out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. If you let him tonight, he'll change you. He'll change you tonight. So I went down and I, the minute I walked, we'd looked at probably 150 different church buildings. The minute I walked inside that one, I said, this is it. My spirit just opened up. And so we were delighted several months ago when Brother Shambach got to come and preach for us on Sunday night. And we love him. He is sort of, I was thinking about Brother Shambach when I got ready to come to service tonight. And I realized something. There's nothing to compare him to because everybody gets compared to him. He's kind of the measuring stick of preachers. You know what I mean? They say it's, well, it's sort of like Shambach. But how many of you know there's nothing like Shambach but Shambach? Would you stand on your feet? Welcome R.W. Shambach to Columbus, Ohio. somebody and say well 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 thank you Lord I don't know what you come to do I said I don't know what you come to do but I come to praise my Lord Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, He's got on the platform, He's got back at the door, He's got in the amen corner, He's got on. God. God don't never change. I know God is God. Oh, praise will be God. He's God when the lightning flashes. God when the thunder rolls. God way up in heaven. God down in my soul. I know God is God. God don't never change. I know God is God. Oh, praise will be God.
is the way we shout on the old campground. This is the way we shout on the old campground. This is the way we shout on the old campground. And we shout just like this on the old campground. Shout just like this on the old campground. Well, we shout just like this on the old campground. Shout just like this on the old campground. Gonna be meeting tonight. Meeting tonight. Some of you look like you don't know where you are. We have one explanation to make. Everybody just turn around and look at somebody and say, this is what you call having church. We're having church. Well, 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 well. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. you sit down look three people in the eye and say I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight 
They may not believe it. Shock them. I believe you're going to get a miracle. Well, thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. I said, glory, glory, glory. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain Free to all A healing stream It flows from Calvary's mountain Everybody now hey, hey. Glory to Jesus. You may be seated, everybody. If I lived in Columbus, I know where I'd go to church. Brother Rob Parsley, thank you for inviting me to camp meeting. What a joy it is to be with you again. This is one church where you can ask how many is you from out of town, and everybody is. <laughs> Ain't nobody lives out here in a cornfield, but a couple of them scarecrows. But we're glad you're here tonight. Many of you are spending the week. I can't think of a better place to go than camp meeting. Amen. We have a table out there, I believe, somewhere with some of our books and tapes. <clears throat> Stop by there, if you will. This Harrison House just published this. Unlocking the power of the 23rd Psalm. I shall not want. Powerful book. Now, if I had to put that title on there, I told Buddy Harrison, I'd put, He's all I want. If you got Jesus, you don't need anything else. The Lord is my shepherd. Most of us haven't moved into this realm yet because we're always wanting. But there, I believe there is a place in God, when, excuse me, when we recognize 
that it's the shepherd's job to take care of the sheep. He will provide. I don't believe I had this book the last time I was here. This is the newest one. They say a title will sell a book. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if that be the case, this is destined to be a bestseller. Let's get drunk. <laughs> now, I spent three years in the Navy, and I never tasted booze. God kept me from it. So I guess I'm authority on this. Let's get drunk. Paul said, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled what he's saying if you want to get drunk get drunk on the Holy Ghost that's what he's saying so pick it up it'll be a blessing to you I'm sure now if you're lazy and you don't like to read get a tape thank God for tapes <clears throat> especially if you're in traffic here in Columbus going and coming from work and you notice how those cars are. I was sitting in my car in Dallas, and I don't know who it was that creeped up on me, but I started bouncing in my car. And I started, hurt, I started hearing boom, 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 boom. Somebody in a pickup truck with them, I don't know what it is, but it, I never heard so much noise. So I grabbed one of my tapes, opened all my windows, and put it on full force. And he hop rotted out of there. I found a way to get moving in traffic. <laughs> this is a two-hour message. This will be a blessing to you. I, I don't believe we've ever sold so many tapes as we did this one. I preached this in Atlanta, Georgia. The very day they buried Martin Luther King Sr. And... God dropped this into my heart and I stood in front of those 3,500 people in that Fox Theater there on Peachtree and I said they just buried the man whose son advocated nonviolence and I said tonight I'm going to take the other end of the spectrum and I'm going to advocate violence and a hush come all over that audience and I said I'm going to use the words of Jesus the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. I'll tell you, this will change your way of thinking. Most of the church has been sitting in that upholstered pew for 20 years. They've been saying, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. One of these days, he's going to drop it in my lap. One of these days, you're going to die. If you're going to get it, you have to get up out of that upholstered pew and eyeball the devil and take it right out of his hand. Let the devil know you've had enough. That devil has no business on your back, in your stomach, in your head, in your knees, in your feet. That devil ain't got no business in your pocketbook. There's only one place that devil has any right to be, and that's under your feet. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Get violent and take it from him. Ooh. Maybe I ought to preach that tonight. Pulling on your string here. Pick it up. Two hours of solid preaching. And then here's another one. I don't have time to mention all of them. Here's four hours of solid preaching. I call it the four freedoms. Freedom from fear. Freedom from condemnation. My God, that's needed in the church today. Freedom from want and freedom from separation. There ain't no way that you can get rid of God. This will bless you. Read it over. Look at it. 
Look at it. Go back and look at them. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and direct you in what he knows that you have need of. What a joy it is to have Dwight Thompson in the audience, and he and his wife. I wish I could stay over and hear him preach tomorrow, but I've been catching him on television. And I think it's the best on television, Dwight. Really appreciate your ministry. God bless you. Thank God there's still a voice. Not an echo, but a voice that's declaring the whole counsel of God. Charlie Watson's here. He's a member of my board down in Lebanon, Ohio, and his brother Dick. We're glad to have them with us. I see a lot of my friends here. Brother Totten, who is my campaign manager who sets up our crusades, He's here. He drove in from West Virginia. I'm, stand up, Brother Totten. I want him to get a look at you. This is Brother Robert Totten, Jr. We're just about ready to set our tent up in New, New York City again. We went back there last year. But this year, Brother Totten found a lot in this, in this borough of Brooklyn. Brooklyn is... I guess the largest, second largest city in the, world, in, in the United States. I don't know how many millions of people are in the borough of Brooklyn, and he found a lot right on Coney Island. Everybody heard of Coney Island. I'm going to go up there and get one of them hot dogs before I leave, I know. And he found 10 acres of ground right by the parachute drop. And God favored us with the parks department, and we're going to be there in... Brooklyn, New York. I wish you'd be praying with us about that crusade. Last year, many of you saw it on TBN. How many of you catch TBN? Do you enjoy it? Yes. TBN came up there. I spent 23 days in the Bronx. And we had about 75 pastors sponsor that meeting. Assemblies of God, Church of God, and all the independents. Now, that's a miracle. You can get all them together. And in 23 days, the actual count on a computer readout of those that answered the altar call was 20,000 decisions for Christ on a computer readout. Man, I was so thrilled. And... The pastor of Central Assembly, you know who I mean, Dwight, his name slips my mind. Slips your mind too? It's right on the tip of my tongue and I can't, who? No, in Springfield, Missouri. He's the pastor of Central Assembly, the big, Phil Wanamaker, that's he. Phil Wanamaker. And Phil Wanamaker saw the report on TBN, and he got a burden for that meeting. And when he heard that there were 20,000 decisions of Christ, decisions for Christ, he took a special offering in his church and sent a man who is a specialist on follow-up and paid his way and he got all those pastors together and showed them how to eyeball all 20,000 of them and give them a personal invitation to come to their churches. Isn't that wonderful? And to know that there are pastors that are interested in getting the converts into the church. And that was a thrill to me. And we went into an area in the Bronx. We were in the South Bronx. Hollywood made a movie out of it. They called it Fort Apache. We were in an area where the police don't even show up. In fact, till this day, you know, every time you put a tent up, the fire department comes out and makes sure your permits are all in order, but they never showed up. I could have stayed there for a year and a half and they'd have never showed up. The borough gave us the property. We are, 
we had to clean off the drug addicts off the property. They had a shooting gallery right there on the property. I always thought a shooting gallery was somebody practicing shooting guns, but no, that's where they shoot drugs. And they had a little shelter there where they sold and used drugs right on the property. We had to clean that off. Had to rent three bulldozers for a week to clean it off. And in that area, we had one of the greatest meetings. Great men of God came in there to help me. T.L. Osborne, Larry Jones, a Baptist, came in to help me. And we even fed the people. He brought in a couple 45-foot tractor trailers loaded with food, and we fed the hungry in the South Bronx. Set up about five feeding stations throughout the area. And... Rosie Greer came in, who has a inner cities work in Los Angeles. Ben Kinchlow, who has a, an inner city work on television. And Ben told me, he said, Brother Schambach, I've never been in anything like this in my life. He said, please, if you go back, call me up again. Where the action is. And I just wanted to share with you one particular miracle. It really thrilled my soul, this one young man. We had a special night for AIDS victims and for drug addicts, and I found the cure for AIDS. And I've been publishing it on television and radio, letting the world know we found the cure for AIDS. Janet Paschal, you sang it. Jesus is the answer to the problem. He is the answer. And this blew me away, Dwight. This man came in with dark glasses on, sitting on the front row. And he came in because somebody gave him a ray of hope. Thank God for the church. That's what God put us here for, to give somebody hope. I said, thank God for hope. When everybody else will turn you loose, Jesus will be waiting by to pick you up again. Can you shout amen? amen? But this young man came in night after night. He answered every altar call. I don't know whether he was on, on every night on that computer readout, but he came and got saved every night. I laid hands on him. The power of God went through his body, and he sat there night after night after night, and the last Monday night of the meeting, in the middle of my message, he got up and walked out. And I wondered, where in the world's he going? He never did this before. And I didn't know until the next night. And he came back. And he told the people, he said, I sat there in that service last night and I got deathly sick. Now, when he was telling this story, I'm standing there laughing. The man's been sick all his life. The thing was, he got healed, and his natural reaction is, I'm sick. <laughs> he never knew what it was to be well. But he thought he got sick, but God was in the thing. So when you get sick, the only one thing to go, do is go check in the hospital. And he checked in the hospital, and they all knew him. And the nurses called his doctor, and he told them to take the blood work and all the fluids and everything and blood pressure. And they put him in bed, and... When the, doctors, when the doctor came in, he come flying into his room and he said, Tories, where you been? He said, man, I'm dying. He says, you ain't dying. You're strong as a horse. He said, not only that, I checked your blood and the AIDS virus is no longer there. Where have you been? <laughs> Got the report from the doctor. He stood up on that bed and said, the man of God laid hands on me and asked Jesus to give me a transfusion and you just told me I don't have AIDS. I found the answer. Jesus is the answer to the AIDS. Hallelujah. You know what he did? Went out on the street and picked up 20 of them the next night and dragged them in. That's what it's all about. When God does something for you, he wants you to go out and let somebody else know the good news. Amen. Well, be in prayer for our Brooklyn meeting.
Is this good water, brother? This looks, uh, it looks awful. Did you get this out of the pond out here? Yuck. Lemon. There ain't nothing like warm lemonade. I believe I could spit a mile right now. When the young man brought me out here to this church tonight, I saw that tent out there and I started throbbing on the inside. I said, my God, he put a tent up just for me. But this is just like a tent. Same spirit here that we have under that tent. I want to read something to you tonight if you have your Bible. Check your watch. It's only 7.30 in Tyler, Texas. I make it a habit of not setting my watch when I move out of Tyler. So I'm glad you start your service early around here. You're not in a hurry, are you? Good, Dwight. I'm glad to see you taking your coat off. All you men can take your coat off. Get comfortable. I want you to turn in your Bible, if you will, please, to the book of Joshua. One of my favorite books. And in your devotional time, I want you to read the whole book. It'll change your life. Read it in one sitting. Then go back over it again. But I want you to turn to the 14th chapter of Joshua, if you will, please. <clears throat> I'm reading from the 14th chapter of Joshua. <clears throat> Beginning at verse number 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenezite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet 
I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now. How many of us can say that now? This is powerful. An 85-year-old warrior. Look at me read verse 11 again. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and come in. Now therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him. And gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Bow your hearts and let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that the anointing of God will mantle each one of us as we sit in your presence. Anoint your servant with a live coal from off the altar tonight. And hide him behind the cross. Let us see no man. Save Jesus. If there's any here within the sound of our voice that have never experienced the reality of Christ, Holy Spirit, do your thing tonight and bring them to the bleeding side of Calvary. Those that are sick, diseased, afflicted, this is camp meeting. Lord Jesus, don't allow one to leave disappointed tonight. But let the faith of God literally come alive in every heart. Let it be a time of receiving. Don't allow one to go home disappointed. But Lord, as they leave tonight, let them go home singing a new song. I got just what I wanted from the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted amen. Amen. And amen. I want to deal with this entire area that I read to you tonight, but I'll use as a text verse number 11 as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now to war, both to go out and to come in. The slogan of this camp meeting that I received through the mail, Dominion 90. And I can't help but think that this particular incident in the life of one of the great men of faith in the Old Testament, Caleb. He never made the Hall of Fame chapter in the book of Hebrews. 
But yet he is one of my favorite characters in this book of Joshua. Joshua, of course, is the other champion. Only two men, only two men out of an entire race of people that entered into their full inheritance in Christ. The odds are against you that you're going, that you're not going to make it. As far as the world is concerned, as far as your friends are concerned, but as long as you have this kind of faith that this man possessed, you are going to make it. You can't lose for winning. You're on the winning side. Just turn around and look at somebody and tell them, say, you're going to make it. I mean, everybody's been telling them they're not, so you tell them you're going to make it. You're going to make it. What kept this faith alive? There's so much involved in this particular scripture that I have read in your hearing tonight, but this is, an, this is a picture of an ideal old age showing in an actual instance how happy and how vigorating, full of energy and an appetite for conflict. I mean a man this old should be looking for a rocking chair. He should join the Geritol set. He should be thinking about drawing a retirement check. Somebody asked me, Brother Shambach, when are you going to retire? I said, I bought four new ones. That's the only kind of retire that I know. <laughs> Old preachers never die. They just blaze away. Can you shout amen, somebody? And as I read, I, I, I feel so encouraged that I can find somebody in this book that's older than I am. 85 years of age and he's looking for a battle. He's looking for a conflict. He's looking for something to conquer. This is my kind of man. He's not looking for some upholstered pew, but he wants to get out in the battle. He said, I feel as strong today as I was 45 years ago for warfare to go out and come back. I'm not looking to get slain in battle. If I'm going out to battle, then I'm more than a conqueror. I'm going to destroy the enemy and put him where he belongs, and that's right under my feet. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? This is a story of a man whose entire life, faith is a life. It involves a life. It's not just a definition. I mean, we faith preachers, we, we, we preach our books and we seven steps to faith. And you've done every one of them and you still don't know what it is. We give definitions of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you repeat it over and over again and you get confused the more you repeat it. But faith is a life. I mean, it's good for 45 years for this man. If your faith don't work when you're 60 or 80, then you might as well get rid of it when you're 20. But I've come to tell you, it's a lifetime. The God that picked you up while you were in your sin and picked you up with his strong right hand and washed you in his blood and took an old stony heart out of you and put in a heart of flesh and clothed you with his righteousness and wrote your name on the land book of life this is only the beginning this is eternal life it's going to last forever the faith of God that he deposited in your life he gave it to you this is faith and you can live by it can you shout yes, yes. hallelujah as I was studying this and reading over this particular Incident, there's no less than five times 
that the Lord spake. He's reminding Joshua. Remember, they're the only two left. I mean, the rest are just kids. They're still in diapers. The other generation has passed away. They weren't allowed to come in and possess the land and hear this 85-year-old man along with Joshua, the commander of chief, the commander in chief, the one that succeeded Moses, had done what Moses failed to do and he brought God's people into their full inheritance. The land was distributed and Caleb waited patiently until everybody had their portion and now it comes his turn. It's still there. His mind went back 45 years ago when Moses sent them out 12 spies those spies they were briefed and sent out find out whether it's a good land see whether the the, the, the cities are walled see what kind of a, a defense they have see whether it's impregnable see whether or not we can go in and claim the land and every one of you know the story 12 men I wouldn't turn my life over to 12 men for all the money in Fort Knox how in the world can you get 12 men to agree on anything I'm only here one night I'm going to hitch and run 12 men 10 of them come back with an evil report Two million plus Jews, the lives of every one of those people are in the report that 12 men are going to bring back. God never originally told Moses to send the spies out. He said, move them on in. But a lot of times we want to check up on God to see what he promised us is good enough to live with. So he sent 12 men out to check on God. And 10 of them come back and said, we can't go in. The sons of Anik live there. The cities are walled. We're grasshoppers in their sight. We might as well turn around and go back to Egypt. How many times has the devil come to you since you've been saved and says, you can't make it. You might as well turn around and go back in the world. You'll never make it in the church. The devil is a liar. Yeah. I said the devil is a liar. Yeah. You are going to make it. He which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it under the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you shout amen with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. But Caleb, and as I read this, Caleb grasp a hold of every word that Moses spake. And he said, every bit of ground that your soles of your feet tread on, you're going to possess that land. So Caleb headed out for the best property in, in the country. And it was, he wanted to find out where the giants lived. I mean, after all, they're the strongest. Strongest people are going to have the best land. And he believed Moses' report because the Lord said it. So he started laying down some footprints around Hebron. 45 years ago. He said, Lord, I believe what you said. And you know the others weren't laying footprints down. They were too busy looking at giants. They were too busy looking at the walled cities. They were too busy looking at the enemy. But Caleb was looking at Hebron and said, this is a place I'd like to live. And I'm going to lay them number 12s right all over the Hebron. This is my place, Lord. You cannot lie. And I'm going to claim the victory. And that's the reason why these two were the last ones to come back. The 10 come back with a bad report. But here comes Joshua and Caleb. And they're carrying the goodies with them. One of them's carrying a bucket of milk. And the other one's got a bucket of honey they have the grapes of Eshkol they have a stave on their shoulders between them the oranges are big as cantaloupes I mean it's a land that flows with milk and honey and they come up the road singing we're able to go up and take the country 
Hallelujah. We're able to march in. Sure, the giants are there. Sure, the cities are walled. But God said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He is by our side. And if God said he's going to be by our side, there ain't no enemy that can stand before us. We are going to make it. Let's go and go in and possess the land. Let's take dominion and move in and lay claim to it. Woo! One of these days, God's going to let me get blessed. Only two. And when you start telling people they're going to make it, God's going to heal you, He's going to bring you through this thing, people start picking up stones from your own family, from your own church. There's some don't believe it, they're too busy playing church. They'd rather sing their three songs and have a 20 minute sermon sing a doxology and see you next week but there are those that are not content with that they want God's best they want God's best they're laying claim to the promise of God they made up their mind they're going to have it no matter what the cost is live or die sink or swim they're going to move out and lay claim to it and put the devil where he belongs hallelujah back in 1960 Dwight, that's when you were 40 years old, back in 1960. I'm getting back at you now. It's wonderful to have a microphone in your hand with him sitting there and he can't retaliate. Of course, you're going to preach tomorrow, but I won't be here. But back in 1960, I built a church. No, I didn't. I didn't build it. I bought one. I rented a building in Newark, New Jersey. I just left Brother Allen and no pastor would sponsor my meeting. I mean, I, I was, they avoided me like the plague. And I was a young man, so I went in and preached anyway. I, I rented this building. It was a Jewish YWHA, Young Women's Hebrew Association. And I rented the thing for $100 a day. It seated 1500 had 300 rooms in it had a swimming pool, a gymnasium, a running track, had a bowling alley. I mean, it was loaded. And I rented the thing, and we got a revival started. People started getting saved, and I didn't have any sponsoring pastors, so I couldn't send these new converts to them churches that wouldn't sponsor my meeting because they don't believe what I believe. So I said, I'm going to build my own church. So we bought the building we were renting. God gave me a message from the first chapter of Joshua where God spoke to Joshua and said, every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you shall possess the land. Now, I was preaching that to me. I wasn't preaching this to the people. And I couldn't wait to get out of there. I said, I've got to get out of here and I've got to march around this building. I've had other ministers with me and after I finished praying for about 500 people, I said to some of the brethren, I said, come with me. We're going to walk around the building. He said, well, what are you, you going to do that for? I said, didn't you hear what I preached tonight? I'm claiming this building. God put it in my heart and I'm going to put my footprints around the building. And you know what they said? Everyone, I'm saying, we'll wait in the car. In other words, they were telling me, your elevator don't go the whole way up. If you're going to be stupid, be stupid all by yourself. So I went around that building. I mean, I marched around it, and I have only one regret. I wish I'd have walked around the whole block. Because the very next day after I walked around that building, I saw a for sale sign in it. There was a for sale sign right in the lawn, and I saw Feast and Feast Realtors. In Newark, and I pulled the sign out, found out where their offices was, and I took the sign down and laid it on the desk, and I said, "Who put this sign on my property?" That man stood up and said, "Where'd you get that sign?" 
I said, 652 High Street. He said, I just put that in there 30 minutes ago. I said, you're the culprit. That building is not for sale. That's my building. He said, who are you? I said, the name's Pastor R.W. Schambach. Already made myself a pastor. Are you listening? He said, you're the man renting that building. I said, that's, yes, sir, that's me. Oh, he says, you want to buy it? I said, no, it's mine. I never bought anything. I didn't know how to buy anything and never had a bank account. But I said, that's my building. I'm claiming the thing. He said, now, preacher, if you want to buy the thing, give me a legitimate offer. I'm the representative. I'm the agent for this. North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company owns this building, and they told us to put it up for sale. And let me just warn you that they turned down $265,000. He could have said a million. I mean, I, I, I couldn't change a quarter. When you're trusting God, you trust God, no matter how much it is. He said, do you have an offer you'd like to give? I said, yes, sir, nothing. He said, are you sure you're a preacher? I said, yeah, but preacher, you know I'm renting a building. He said, what do you mean nothing? I said, well, I believe in starting low, brother. You can't get no lower than that. And he says, well, he said, look, you're wasting my time. Just come around when you get some money. And then the Holy Spirit dropped it in my heart. He said, offer the man $75,000. And you don't question God. Now, he told me 265 they turned down. And I said, sir, I got an offer. It just came to me. He said, what kind of an offer? I said, $75,000. He said, I told you they turned down 75, I mean 265. I said, I know what you said, but it just came to me. 75, I'm going to get it for that. Well, he said, talk to me when you get some money. I said, no, wait a minute. Call the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company now. So I'm not going to waste their time. I put $10 on the table. I said, I'll pay for the call. Call them, I insisted. And he dialed, turned his swivel chair around. Hello. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. But I got a crazy preacher here. <laughs> He's renting the building now, yes. He, I told him you folks turned down $265,000. But he told me to offer you $75,000. And I told him there ain't no way you're going to do it. And uh, what'd you say? And he went like this. Say that again. Well, it's your building. You can do what you want with it. And he hung up the phone. He turned around to me. He says, you ain't crazy, are you? I said, no, sir. I'm not crazy. I said, what did the man say? He said, first of all, he said, the phone call didn't go into the switchboard. They were having a board of directors meeting and the phone rang right in the board of directors meeting and the chairman of the board picked up the phone. <laughs> only the Holy Ghost knows that. Are you listening to me? I said, only the Holy Ghost knew that. And he said, I t you heard the conversation. He said, the man told me to sell it to you for $75,000, preacher. He said, they had such a good year on life insurance, they'll just take a credit with the government and take a tax break and let the preacher have the building for $75,000. Woo, I started shouting. He said, now, preacher, how much money you got to put down? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, just when I think you're getting sense, now you're talking crazy again. I said, don't worry, my father owns everything. I'll get it from my father. Woo, I'm trying to encourage some of you folks here tonight. He said, does your father, does he have money? I said, you don't know like I know what my father's got. I said, he always comes to my rescue. My father's in oil in Texas. My father is in wheat in Kansas. My father is in diamonds in South Africa. My father is in coal in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. My father is in automobiles in Detroit. 
I'm talking about a father that says I bless you going in and I bless you coming out and I bless your basket and I bless your store and I bless the fruit of your womb. I bless you in the city. I bless you in the country. I'll make you the head and not the tail and you shall lend and not borrow. Come on, shout yes. I am blessed. Sit down. You ain't, I ain't done yet. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, let me get off of this. We got the building. And one of those preachers that would not go walking with me, that sat in the car when he found out God blessed me with the building, he called me one day. Praise the Lord, Brother Shambach. Praise the Lord, Brother he said, I'm over here in Englewood. I found me a building I want. I want you to come over and walk around it for me. I said, tell me where it is, brother. Take me about 30 minutes to get there. He told me where it was, and I said, remember one thing. If I use my feet, that's going to be my building. He never hung the phone up. He just said, don't come over. Because he knew I made it work one time. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God said every bit of ground that the soles of your feet, of your feet, not your mama's feet, not your papa's feet, but your feet, not your preacher's feet, not the church's feet, but your feet. You're going to have to whip the devil yourself. You're going to have to eyeball him. Let God know it's you. Hallelujah. I'm going to have my miracle now. Now, wait a minute. While you're standing there, you might as well do something else. 30 minutes ago, you told somebody, I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight. Turn around to that same person and say, uh uh, tonight's my night for the miracle. I'm using my own feet tonight. Yes. I said, yes. I said, yes. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Be seated. I ain't done. That's my introduction. He said five times the Lord spoke. Once he unites with Joshua and four times he takes it to himself. Just like when you read John 3.16 For God so loved the world That's too general That he gave his only begotten son Whosoever believeth on him But you translate it another way And I found it where it says he gave himself for me Forget the world. I know he died for the world, but he loved me. He died for me. He gave himself for me. He had me in mind. What God did, he did for Shambach. And it's up to Shambach to stand on that word and say, I will not be moved. I refuse to let you go until I get my miracle. Hallelujah. Oh, I love this man of God. For 45 years, he hid this word in his heart. He wouldn't make a good charismatic. Just speak it once, because if you speak it more than once, it's a sign of unbelief. Woo. Bible says ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you now you read that in the Greek it leaves a connotation ask and keep on asking knock 
keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. What am I trying to say? Don't give up. 45 years. 45 years wandering around in the wilderness with those unbelievers but he had his eye fixed on those footprints going around Hebron are you listening to me here's a man who believed God if you don't want to believe it help yourself but as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord I'm going to trust God I'm going to lay claim to his promise Somebody out in that world that don't know God when they suffer. It's long years of pain and tears in their measuring stick. But not so with the child of God. Sorrow, we got a different thermometer. We're the children of God. Sorrow may endure for the night. But joy is coming in the morning. Can you shout amen? For 35 years, he had his eyes fixed on that on that mountain. He had his eyes fixed on Hebron. He laid down some footprints. God promised him long life. Two things. He says, your life will be prolonged and you shall possess the territory. And every time he got up in the morning, he said, thank God I'm still alive. God said he's going to give me long life and I'm going to possess the land. He said, every bit of ground that the soles of my feet tread on, I'm going to possess it. He had his eye fixed on that result. God's going to give it to me. And 45 years passed and now he says, now therefore give me this mountain you don't know how close you are to it you don't know how close you are to your miracle don't give up my God hang in there I come to tell you help is on the way I said help is on the way a life that is built upon faith like this man is a life of hopefulness till the very end. When the feast is over, the appetite is dulled, there's little to be done. You push back in your chair. But to the child of God, he keeps the good wine until last. You ain't seen anything yet. Make sure I get a tape of tomorrow night's message. I want to get it so I can preach it right after I hear Dwight preach that thing. <laughs> Rod, will you make sure I get one of them tapes, please? Special it to me, because I'll go to on TBN with it, and I'll preach it before he does. <laughs> but you know, I believe we are headed for the greatest day the church has ever seen. Oh, hallelujah. This is not the time for giving up but this is the time for going through can you shout amen I'm going through with Jesus I've started with him and I'm going through with him I got a made up mind God cannot lie if he said it he'll do it if he spoke it he will bring it to pass this man refused to give up 85 years of age but he has the same strength he has the same kind of faith. When you see a man like this, this life is something to look back at. When those 10 spies came back intimidated, all they could see was the enemy. Their faith was in the wrong frame of reference. They made the mistake of comparing themselves with that enemy instead of comparing that enemy with God. When that trouble comes, don't get your eye on the trouble. When the storm comes, don't get your eye on the storm. Keep your eye on Jesus. Because if he's still by your side, you're going to make it. I said you're going to make it. Hallelujah. Bring God into the battle. I said, bring him into the conflict. You and God is a majority. I don't care what the odds are. You're going to make it. Look at the picture of David and Goliath. Thank God David came to bring food to his brethren in Saul's army. 
there was a time in Saul's life he'd have never been in that tent he'd have been out there fighting that, that, that giant but the spirit of the Lord left him in the same verse it says the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul in the same verse the spirit of the Lord came on David David slew the lion and the bear his father Jesse said take some homemade cornbread down to your brothers they're down there fighting they ain't fighting they're playing foxhole like most church folks I know they're digging in Woo. if you can't holler amen holler ouch every day Goliath would come out with them number 15's and a half and every time he'd let one of those feet hit the ground, it was a 9.8 on the Richter scale. <laughs> and he would come out. The earth would quake. And every one of God's soldiers started digging them foxholes deeper. And Goliath said, Hey, you bunch of sissies! You Christians, hey, send me your best man. Whoever wins, the losers will serve the winner. Ain't nobody gonna, ain't nobody gonna accept the challenge until David comes down with his box lunch <laughs> and delivers it to his brothers. And here comes Goliath. He said to his brother, get on out there and get him. Shut up, boy. Who's watching them sheep? Go on home and watch them. I know you're out here just to show off. You coming out here to see the battle. What battle? They in foxholes. They ain't nobody fighting. David's trying to encourage him to get out there and whip him. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of our God? Now he had the right frame of faith, frame of reference. His faith was in God, not in Goliath. It wasn't in himself. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. David must have been a master salesman because he talked Saul and letting him go out the fighting. He wanted to put his armor on him. He said, here, take my helmet. Put my breastplate on. Take my sword. Take my shield. Put the boots on. Now go get him. He said, I can't move now, brother. I haven't proved these I don't know anything about these weapons he said let me just take my slingshot that's all I need I'm going out in the name of the Lord of hosts that's all I need nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I claim in the name of Jesus Peter and John going in the temple and said silver and gold have I none but what I have I give in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk all he had David waded through that brook and picked up five stones you know the story it's a beautiful story put four of them in his pouch and put one in the sling I heard preachers say that those five stones represented the five-fold ministry gifts. Sounded good, but I found out, I knew why David picked up five. He found out Goliath had four brothers. And after he whipped Goliath, he knew them other four were going to come after him. So he just picked up four more stones while he was at it. And if you'll read the word, you'll find out Goliath had four more brothers. Because he had a confidence in his God. And he went out to Goliath, just a mere lad, ain't old enough to shave, and here he has nothing but a slingshot. One little stone in it. And Goliath sees him coming. What am I, a dog? Coming out here with a shepherd's staff in one hand and a slingshot in the other. Stop, boy! I'll feed your carcasses to the birds of the air. You right, brother. Them birds are going to eat today. <laughs> but it's going to be Philistine meat. <laughs> Woo, I like his faith, don't you? 
He said, I'm going to draw a line. You take one more step further, and I'm going to kill you. He says, you come to me with your sword and your spear. But he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He had no fear. This is the kind of faith I'm talking about. Don't ever run from the devil. When he comes out against you one way, he'll flee seven ways. Can you shout amen? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Shout yes. yes. He got the devil mad. I mean the Philistine mad. Don't you like to make him mad? He put that sling in there and said, Oh, my Lord. And they said America had the first missile. Don't you ever believe it? <laughs> he said, Holy Ghost, sit on that rock. Whoosh. Right between the eyes. One shot. Goliath is laying there. Takes his own sword, sword and takes the head off. Are you listening to me? In the name of the Lord of hosts, you don't realize what you possess. I said you don't realize what you possess. How many of you got the Holy Ghost? No, you misunderstood me. How many of you talk in tongues? You didn't misunderstand me. <laughs> you don't know what you got. I hear most people, they say, God gave me a prayer language. This ain't no prayer language. It's the Holy Ghost, brother. Yeah. I said, this is Holy Ghost. I said, this is Holy Ghost. Yeah. Jesus said to his disciples, Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. How many were in that upper room? 120. You read the book, 15th chapter of Corinthians, and Paul said he was seen of above 500 brethren. What happened to the 380? They missed their appointment. Only 120 was in that upper room where the Holy Ghost was filled out, was poured out. He wasn't poured out on the seashore. He wasn't poured out on the golf links. He wasn't poured out on the mountaintop. I don't know where them 380 went, but I mean, after all, they saw him, the resurrected Christ. We got it all. We saw him on the cross. We saw him crucified. We saw him when he come out of the grave. There ain't no more. Jesus said, go to that upper room and wait. For you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. When we think of the Holy Ghost, all we think of is a little old tongue. The Holy Ghost is the third person of the divine trinity. Just a real a person as Jesus was. Are you listening to me? Jesus came to this planet only for 33 years, but the Holy Ghost has been here for 2,000 years. Are you listening to me? And he's taken up residence where? In me. In you. That's what this is all about. This is the temple of God. I said, this is the temple of God. We are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. God lives here in me. And I have within me the answer to the earth's problems out there in that world. Woo. Once we recognize this, brother, I recognize that you have in you what I have in me. You have the presence of God. You carry God around in you like I carry God around in me. And I don't care whatever happens to you. I'm not going to let anybody talk about you because you're carrying Christ in that body. You're carrying the Holy Ghost in that body. Hallelujah. 
It's all right for us to get on each other once in a while, but don't let that world touch us. Can you shout amen? That world ain't got no business touching the church. I come from a big family. My sister used to beat me up. Ooh, Margaret was something else. Margaret and I used to get in fights all the time. She'd beat me up all the time. But don't let nobody else jump on me. Margaret will be on them before you can count five. You see what I'm getting at? We're brothers. Dwight, you got the same Holy Ghost in you that I got in me. And I'm not going around talking about anybody else that got the Holy Ghost in them. He's my brother. He's carrying, he's carrying God around in him like I'm carrying him around in me. And once we recognize that we are the temple of God, that we are the temple of God, we are the temple of God, you've got to know this. Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know what he's saying? What he's saying is you're carrying that Holy Ghost around in a body that can sin. That'll blow you away. But God chose to put that Holy Ghost in this skin. God dwelt in that skin in the Old Testament, the tabernacle. The ugliest thing in the desert was that tabernacle. And don't you look so sanctified. You're the ugliest thing God ever made but yet the Holy Ghost lives there. I said the Holy Ghost lives there. Jesus lives in there. Hallelujah. I'm talking about we're nothing but the vessel that's carrying the Holy Ghost around. And if you fall, I'm not going to talk about you, but I'm going to lift you up because I know that you have a vessel like I have. I'm not going to talk about you. If I'm going to talk about you, I'll get on my knees and talk about you. Can you shout amen? Hallelujah. This is the time for the church to come together. We are the body of Christ. We have a measure of the Holy Ghost. And if this body ever gets to its fullness, we're going to have what Jesus had. And when you walk into a place where there's demons, they're going to look at you and say, why have you come to torment us before our time? They're going to recognize that you have the same thing in you that Jesus had in him when he walked the shores of Galilee. I'm talking about a God that dwells in you. We have the answer for the needs of that world out there. Shout yes. yes. Woo. How did I get off on that? <laughs> Caleb discovered the secret of perpetual youth. People always ask me how old I am. I said, none of your business. <laughs> because I got my age set back. I had a tent up, Dwight, in Washington, D.C. And I had a man come into my meeting. He said, Brother Scheinbach, I'm a prophet. I said, get on that tent, prophet. We got a lot of them in there. Get in there and listen to the word preached tonight. He said, yeah, but I got a special gift. I said, what's your gift? He said, I set people's ages back. <laughs> oh, I grabbed his hand. I said, brother, put that gift to work right now. I made him work that gift right there in that tent before I preached. And he set my age back. And I, mm, 20 years. And I, mm. and I believed it. I wrote my address down. I said, I want you to go to this home in Pennsylvania. And the lady that answers that door, I want you to put your hands on that woman and set her age back. Tell her I ain't living with no old woman no more. My wife said to me, he never did show up. I said, then I'm going to have to set it back. <laughs> How many of you know you can get your youth renewed? 
I like what Caleb said. He said, I'm just as strong today, 85 years of age. I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago for war to go out and fight and come back victoriously. He said, now therefore, give me this mountain. Woo-wee. That's my kind of man. Looking for another fight. Looking for another battle. 85 years of age. Dominion 90. God's not going to drop it in your lap. You've got to fight for it. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap. And green. The fountain of youth is no fable, but it's a fact. And it rises from beneath the threshold of the temple door. The stream is coming out. The prophet saw it in his vision. Ezekiel saw it. Jesus said, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water you've got it on the inside of you we've been teaching people how to talk in tongues everything has got a taught Christ a taught Holy Ghost everything's taught God didn't say out of your head will flow but out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water hallelujah I said hallelujah 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 we don't realize what we possess. Hear me, church. You read that book of Acts over again. Miracles was everyday living. You can't force a miracle. They just happen. Just to hear pastor, what he said happened last night. Woman in the parking lot getting up out of a wheelchair. That's the, way, that's the normal. But we can talk more about miracles than what we have the power to produce. People tell me they got the Holy Ghost. I don't want to hear the tongue. I want to see the power. I said, I want to see the power. I want to see the power. When they got the Holy Ghost in that upper room, 120 of them. You know what it was? Instead of one Christ, there's 120 of them now. Jesus laid one body down on Calvary and he picked another body up on the day of Pentecost. We are the body of Christ. And they went everywhere. They went everywhere and preached. On the streets, they opened blind eyes. They unstopped deaf ears. They made the lame to walk. They put to work what they have. What I have, I give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It's coming. I said, it's coming. He's going to do it again. I was privileged some years ago to see God move in such a miraculous way. I have never seen it before and I've never seen it since. I saw 12 wheelchairs on this side, 15 stretchers on this side. A little boy who was born with 26 diseases, born blind and deaf and dumb. Both of his little arms were crippled and deformed and twisted and matted together. The knees were in his stomach. Elbows touching the knees, and he had no feet. And in one split moment of time, God walked into that place. First thing I saw was that tongue hanging on that boy's chin. It snapped in his mouth for the first time in four years. Milky colored eyes began to whirl like whirlpools. Beautiful color of brown came in. You knew God opened the eyes. The arms began to snap and crack like pieces of cord would break. And the knees began to bend and crack and snap. I saw God create feet on two clubs. I saw the toes while they were being formed. I, nobody told me this. I saw this with my own eyes. Are you listening to me? 26 diseases. He had several heart problems, kidney problems, all kind of organ internal problems. 
God supernaturally and miraculously healed that boy on the spot. And while God was doing that in front of 3,500 people, all 12 people in those wheelchairs, like a master sergeant was commanding them to stand up, all 12 of them got up out of those wheelchairs and walked out of there healed. Are you listening to me? I saw this. Just like a maestro was conducting an orchestra, every eye went from the wheelchairs over to the stretchers like they were expecting something. And it happened, everybody in the stretchers got up and they walked out of those stretchers totally healed. Six or seven people with white canes walked out of the audience with six inches of red. Six or seven blind people brought their canes and threw them on the platform. There was a dozen hearing aids, those old-fashioned hearing aids that looks like that little recorder you have. They're not the kind that you hide in the ear like they have today. Everything is sophisticated today. But 12 of them, I don't know how many eyeglasses people just took them off their eyes. We took about two bushels of eyeglasses out. Women lost three sizes in their dresses. Many of them had tumors and they just disappeared. Are you listening to me? For the first time in my life, I saw everybody in that audience healed by the power of God and nobody laid hands on them. But the power of the Lord was present to heal. I believe God lifted the veil to show me what's going to happen in this last day. Hear me, church. You ain't seen nothing yet. God's going to pour out his spirit. It'll not be the glory glorification of man we won't lift man up but we'll give God the praise we'll give God the glory it won't be man laying hands on them but it'll be the nail scarred hand of Calvary God is gonna do it again shout yes every time I go to church my spirit cries do it again Lord let this be the night let this be the night let this be the night and you know what I feel the same spirit here tonight that I felt back there in 1957 when I saw God do this thing God is in this house this is camp meeting night whatever you want you can get it tonight because Jesus is here to do what he said he would do Oh, hallelujah. We evangelists preach revival and we're going to see a revival. But that revival has to come through the church. And the church got to get renewed first. It's renewal for the church. What was is going to come around. Are you listening to me? The book of Acts. You're going to see it all over again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll be going out into the streets. Instead of putting money in the coffers of those beggars, you'll say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and be made whole. Hey, shout yes. You'll take a bottle of oil into the hospitals and you'll anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and you'll just move on to the next one and we'll empty the hospitals. Can you shout amen? They'll be bringing dead bodies in here and we're gonna see them rise and we're gonna call them out of the grave. We're gonna call them out of the dead. Can you shout yes? Do it again. Just be seated for a moment, if you will. Church, something in me is crying out for it. Every one of us know what it is to fail. But aren't you glad God didn't give up on you? Now, if you're perfect, you'll have to forgive us, uh, us imperfect folks. We're striving for it. But thank God he abides in this vessel. Turn around and look at somebody and say, Jesus lives in me. Just to know that. He's taken up precedence there. Holy Ghost. Now if you're here tonight 
you've never experienced Christ in your life you can't receive the Holy Ghost until you get saved I had a lady in New York come to me and ask me to pray for her son she said pray and ask God to fill him with the Holy Ghost and save him I said if God does it in that order your son's going to blow up Because you can't put this new wine in old bottles. you got to get a new bottle. you got to be born again first. And when you get a new vessel, then you can hold that new wine of the Holy Ghost. If you're here tonight, and you've never experienced Christ. I had a man in Seattle come to me and he said, Preacher, am I saved? I said, No, sir. Well, he said, You don't know me. I said, Don't have to. When you get saved, you won't go around asking somebody, am I? You'll be going around saying, I am saved. I know it. His spirit bears witness with my spirit. I'm not talking about shaking a preacher's hand. I'm not talking about signing your name on a church book. I'm talking about being born again. If you've never experienced Christ in your life, I want you to bow your heads, everybody, please. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to him in this camp meeting. July 31st. You'll never forget it. 1990. Be a new beginning for you. I don't care how many times you tried, how many times you failed. You may be bound by drugs, alcohol, perverted, sex. Jesus Christ will take you just as you are and he'll transform you by his power. But you've got to come to him the Bible says, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Now, I'm going to count to three. Just simply one, two, and three. If you want my prayer, you want to know that you're a child of God. I don't care how many times you tried and failed. He'll pick you up. I'll guarantee he will. I want you to throw your hand up when you hear me say three. All over the building. It's either heaven or hell. It's either Christ or the devil. You're either saved or you're lost. There is no in-between ground. Get your hand ready. Here's the first one. Here it is. Don't you let any devil in hell or Columbus keep that hand down tonight. Here's the first one. One! Counting down to eternity. 25 seconds. Where will you spend it? Hear me, beloved. God sends nobody to hell. You send yourself when you reject the only plan of salvation. I'm happy to be the one to tell you Mohammed's not the way. Buddha's not the way. Hare Krishna's not the way. Mr. Moon's not the way. You've got to get higher than the moon. You've got to get to the sun. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here's the second one. Here it is. Two. Get your hand ready. I don't care how many times you tried and failed. You feel God tugging at your heart. That's the Spirit of God. He's wooing you to the bleeding side of Calvary tonight. Seven seconds to eternity. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, get your hand ready. This is your night. Be the greatest miracle you've ever had. Here's your signal. Get your hand ready. Here it is. Three! Shoot it up. Quick, quick, quick. All over this place. Keep your heads bowed, everybody. You that have your hands raised, stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you right there where you stand. Quickly. Right there where you stand. Quick, quick, quick. You that are watching my television, dial that number on your screen. That's how you do what these folks are doing. Somebody's waiting to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you, you that are standing. You that are seated, keep your heads bowed, please. If you're standing, you put your hand down. I want you to be comfortable. Now bow your heads, we're going to pray. Anybody else want to get in on this quickly? You feel God tugging at your heart? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? 
Let me throw it open for a little few more seconds. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Quickly. Please don't turn him aside. This may be your last opportunity. God sent you here tonight. This is your night. Thank you, sir. Quickly, before I pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, every one of these that are standing, I thank you for every one of them. Devil, you can have a one of them. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan. And I adjure you by Jesus. Loose them and let them go. Lord, you said whatever I loose on earth, you loose in heaven. Whatever I bind on earth, you bind in heaven. I loose the people from the clutches of the devil. And I bind you, Satan. You'll never be able to attack them this way again. This is going to be their first night of eternal life. Hallelujah. You that are seated, keep your heads bowed. You that are standing, look at me, please. Look right here at me. You know what Jesus said, and I love this. He said, if you confess me before men, he said, I'll confess you before my Father. The greatest confessor, your high priest, if you confess me before men. But he said, if you deny me before men, he gives you the other side of the coin. He said, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. See, how can I get him to confess me? Slip into the aisle and come down here and stand with me for about two minutes. I'm going to pray for you right here. Come. Don't sit down. Let God know you're not ashamed. I'm going to wait for you to come from the balconies from the side. You're coming to Jesus. You that are watching by television, dial that number on your screen. Somebody's waiting to pray. That's how you come to him. Sing it. Sing it. Come a little closer. Oh, thank God. They're coming from all over. This is what camp meeting's all about. Oh, thank God. Audience, stand with me, please.
that a beautiful song? Remain standing, everybody. Look here at me, please. Every one of you in front of me, look right here at me. I want to talk to you. Right into your heart. You watching by television, talking to you too. I have a secret belief. And I don't put this out as doctrine, but I believe this. The first step you took to come down here, God put a hook in your jaw and served notice on the devil and said, you can't have her no more, Satan. She's mine now. Without even saying a word. You showed him some action. God said, he or she that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. The greatest promise. And he also said this. Notice the participation. He said, if you confess your sin, he said, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. And I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's so simple we stumble over it. Man is so macho. What can I do? You can't do nothing. He did it all 2,000 years ago. All he wants you to do is come. He's done it all. Raise your right hand. Audience, raise your right hand for a loved one. Repeat this after me. I'm going to put some words in your mouth, in your home. I want you to say the same thing. Say, Father. Father. In Jesus' name. name, I I come to you tonight. And I come as a sinner. And I confess my sin. sin. Lord, I repent of my sin. sin. That means I turn my back on it. I I made up my mind mind that I'm going to serve the Lord Lord and make heaven my home. home. I'm through with the world. I'm through with the the flesh. flesh. Devil. Devil. Hear me. me. I'm through with you. I choose choose Jesus Christ Christ as my Lord and Savior. I I believe believe with my heart heart that Jesus is Lord. Lord. I believe he died on Calvary. I believe he he was buried. buried. And according to the scriptures, I believe he arose from the dead. He He ascended to heaven. heaven. Sat down at the right hand of the Father. Father. Jesus, Jesus. you represent me there. there. From tonight on, on, I want to represent you here. here. But Lord, I'm weak. weak. I confess that to you. you. So I invite you to come into my life by your spirit walk in me talk in me be my God let me be your child thank you Lord I believe with my heart confess with my mouth you said I'm saved I believe that did you hear that devil I'm saved and I know that I am now raise both hands and thank him I'm going to send the word of God to every member of your family Holy Spirit sick them every member of their family bring them to the bleeding side of Calvary and don't stop until every member of the family comes to the foot of the cross in Jesus name remain standing now look at me Look here at me. Welcome to the family of God. God doesn't even remember what you used to be anymore. All he can see is the blood. Now, I love you too much to tell you to go to the church of your choice. Because your choice might be a cold, dead one. Get out of them cold, dead refrigerators. and Find one that's red hot. Full of the Holy Ghost where the word is being preached where it's being practiced, where people are being saved and healed and delivered. Now, many of you may be from out of town, but go shopping. Think chili pepper when you're looking for a church. But if you're in the immediate vicinity, I can't think of a better church than the one I'm in right now. Come here, Pastor. You that are watching this by television, this is the World Harvest Church in Columbus, Ohio. And we're in camp meeting. Welcome to camp meeting, and this is Rod Parsley. Would you greet these folks, Pastor? 
sure will. We're certainly glad to have you. And you that are watching by television, you make sure you keep dialing that number on your screen. The same presence of God that's right here is right there where you are. Reach out to Jesus. He's already reaching out to you. And we're believing for you right now that you'll have a life-changing experience with Jesus of Nazareth. We're so glad you've come. We call this area down here the starting blocks because there's no prize for starting. The Bible said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, Brother Shambach's job's to get you here. Our job's to keep you here, to keep you in the old ship of Zion. When your life starts rocking and reeling like a drunken man, just to pat you on the knee and say, hold on now, it's just going to be all right. We've been this way before and help you navigate successfully all the way through to the time when the gates will be lifted up and the everlasting arms will be raised and the King of glory will come through and for eternity we're going to be with Jesus. How many of you glad for that tonight? You're on your way now. You were on your way to hell, but now you're on your way to heaven. Shout hallelujah. We want to give you some information and pray with you and take down your name so that we can continue to minister to you. If you just turn to your right and my left and find this great preacher over here with his Bible raised, he's going to lead you to the prayer and conference room where I'm going to share some words with you and give you some literature as we thank God for what he's done in your life tonight. And you too, you keep calling, dialing that number on your screen. Let's give the Lord a hand for the blessing of God that's been imparted to these tonight. Once they were blind, but now they see. Once they were dead, but now they're alive by the power of God. 